My sisters and brothers, once again, good afternoon. Today we're celebrating this beautiful feast of the body and blood of Christ, Corpus Christi, which points to the source and the summit of our faith, the Eucharist. And it is the center of who we are and what we are as a people and as a church. Benny Flynn has written a wonderful book called The Seven Secrets of the Holy Eucharist. And uh, if you ever have a chance to read it, I encourage you to do it. He makes seven points in there that I just want to summarize very quickly. The first is that the Eucharist is alive. Jesus is contained, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. The second is that Christ is not alone. When we receive the Eucharist, we enter into communion with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is only one Mass, and what that means is that heaven and earth are united uh, through Jesus at the Holy Mass. And of course, we say that because at the moment of the consecration, heaven and earth come together and the communion of saints are gathered around the altar as Jesus becomes our sacrifice. This is not just one miracle. The Eucharist is, is, in the, spirit, is the spiritual wealth of the church. It's Jesus, it's the Trinity, it's the union of heaven and earth, it's the communion of saints. We don't just receive. Jesus is asking us to become one with him. And he wants us to become one with him because he wants to work with us and through us to serve all the, those that he places in our care. Every reception is different, and this is important because the purity of our soul determines the efficacy of the grace of the sacrament that we receive. That's why you go to confession on a regular basis. And there is no limit. Some of the saints actually prayed the spiritual communion prayer every 15 minutes throughout the day. They received, but they also prayed. And during this time of pandemic, that's one of the reasons why, for those who cannot make it at Mass, uh, we pray the spiritual communion prayer um, at, uh, at, at the time of, of communion. In addition to that, we have on our social media the spiritual communion prayer. So throughout the day, you can just tune us in and pray the spiritual communion. So always remember, the Eucharist is the source and summit of who we are as a people and as a church. My sisters and brothers, over the last couple of weeks, as a country and as a world, we've experienced a lot of things. And the Holy Father has spoken about this. The U.S. Conference of Bishops have spoken about this. Archbishop Aquila has spoken about this. And one of the things that I think is important is for all of us to read all of these things that have been written so that we can figure out exactly what it is that is, is working in us in these times and how we process these times to become part of our spiritual life. And what I'd like to do is share a reflection uh, that, uh, that I've written about the last couple of weeks. And I start with a quote by Pope Francis. He says, Dear brothers and sisters in the United States, I have witnessed with great concern the disturbing social unrest that your nation in these past days, following the tragic death of Mr. George Floyd, my friends, we cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form, and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. At the same time, we have to recognize that the violence of recent nights is self-destructive and self-defeating. Nothing is gained by violence, and so much is lost. Pope Francis. And this is from me, and it's from my heart. The tragic events of the last several weeks have put into poignant clarity for me the principles of Catholic social doctrine, the principles of our founding fathers in liberty and justice for all, and the principles of inclusion and equality that should form our conscience and guide our actions as intentional disciples of Jesus Christ. The preaching, the teaching, the healing, and the raising from the dead of Jesus Christ was not based on the color of one's skin or the country of one's origin. It was based on one's faith in God, one's hope of salvation, and one's love of others. Jesus sent his apostles and disciples to the ends of the earth to share the word, world, word of God. Jesus was not a racist. He excluded no one. As his brother, neither should I. An often unused form of contrition in the Catholic Church is a general confession. It invokes looking at one's entire life 
and our sins against God and our sins against others. Perhaps in this tragic time, it's important for each of us to make a general confession as it relates to the sin of racism in our life. This examination of conscience for the sin of racism can be formed for each chapter of your life. For me, it would cover five chapters. Chapter one. In my schools, did I, how did I treat my fellow black students at Newland Elementary School, Perry School, Presentation of Our Lady School, Regis High School, the Colorado School of Mines, and the Kennedy School at Harvard? Was I mean, insensitive, willfully hurtful, or intentionally discriminating? Did I ridicule or race bait? Did I see, uh, did, did I see others do this and not challenge them? Chapter two. In my 35-year professional career, how did I treat black candidates for jobs, the black members of my staff, the inclusion of black, black members on boards and commissions, and the effects of public policy decisions and actions on the black community? Were my professional actions racially fair? Did my staff and boards reflect the diversity of the population which I served? In my community and social life, did I pay attention to the needs of and provide services to the black community in the programs and outreach of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Colorado, the Salvation Army, Sarah Colorado and Sarah USA, my parish council work at Mother of God Church? Does my circle of friends reflect the diversity of the communities, schools, social organizations, church community, neighborhood and social events from which my friends are drawn? Do I support or belong to organizations that discriminate or have racist, racist, racist undertones? Am I a person who includes or excludes? Chapter four. In my life as a seminarian and as Catholic priest in 12 parishes and mis missions in Massachusetts and Colorado over the last 10 years, did my initiatives transcend race and ethnicity? Did my liturgies include cultural references and prayers for an end to racism and inequality? Do I allocate my time equally to all, regardless of their religion, the color of their skin, or their political ideology? Have I included people of color in the planning, organizing, and implementation of parish councils, parish programs, and parish events? Chapter five. Have I used my personal time, talent, and treasure to support those organizations and activities that build or divide? Have my actions opened or healed a core wound? Am I a racial Pharisee, or do I really believe that what I say and do matters? In all my chapters, did I follow the politics of inclusion or exclusion? And equally important, have I hurt anyone through the sins of commission or omission? Were any actions in these chapters racially motivated? While my life is given as the example, the narrative is designed to provide a template to examine your conscience and to make a general confession of your own in those areas of implicit or explicit racism in all aspects of your life. God created everyone for one purpose, to spend eternal life with him. God created a diverse world of nation nationalities, diverse colors of skin, diverse forms of government, and diverse cultures that often may not look like our own personal world. God created the Catholic Church to serve the entire world unconditionally and without reservation. And you and I are that church. At its core is the first principle of Catholic social doctrine, the dignity of the human being, a dignity free of racism. The politics of Catholic social doctrine reflect diversity and reject racism. In confession, we talk about restitution. That can take many forms compensation for the past, a change of practice in the present, and a way of life in the future, with a universal core that has only one color, love. For anyone reading or hearing this reflection who was part of one of my chapters and whom I've racially offended, dismissed, or diminished, I apologize. My restitution will be reflected not in rewriting my past, but in serving all the people that God has placed in my care in my present with respect, inclusion, compassion, understanding, and love by resetting those aspects of my life that are not in balance. A national conscience is formed through the collection of individual responses. That's you and me. And if we multiply that by the population of Denver, the population of Colorado, or the population of the United States, 
We have a nation in which George Floyd did not die in vain, and black lives do matter, not just in print, but in my thought, word, and deed. Servant of God, Julia Greeley, pray for us. May God bless you and keep you.